Okay, so um, this is um, uh, a side project of mine and um, something I came across during my work in the Canaries. I got interested in the use of volcanic particles in agriculture. And um, well, during my various travels, you, uh, uh, I couldn't help but come across other kind of examples. So I was wondering what is the secret behind it? And uh, I grew up in a, in a farming village in southern Germany, so I do have a natural interest in these kind of things. And combining all of this led me to, to work a little bit on this. And as Tom said, uh, it led to a little paper. I have some reprints here for those of you who are interested. I can hand them out later. But let me get into this now. Um, the use of uh, lapillis, pumices, small volcanic particles is widespread, as we all know. Well, it starts off with primitive housing, uh, like this cave here in the Canary Islands, which is stuck into uh, tufts and lapilli deposits, and they're easy to quarry, so uh, Aboriginal people have used that. And uh, of course, there's building supplement for concrete. This is a really wide use of volcanic particles. And as abrasives, there is actually pumice in most toothpaste, particularly when there's whitening functions in your toothpaste. And of course, if you have stonewashed jeans, it's, it's pumice. That's the stone behind it. And of course, it's used in agriculture and gardening. Here is a selection of wines from the Canary Islands, named after the Caldera de Banda Mar. And the caldera erupted a large amount of uh, lapilli about 2,000 years ago, and this is where the wine is grown on. So I wondered, what is the secret of these lapilli? And they're called picon in the Canary Islands. And uh, what do they do really for agriculture? So, but uh, before I go into the canary problem, let me give you some other examples. And uh, I was working a little bit in France a while back. And uh, there you have not only kind of things like volvic, which is a water coming from a volcanic aquifer, but you also have uh, wines being grown on volcanic soils, and uh, this is a widespread phenomenon. Volcanic soils seem to be good for agriculture in general. And um, here, if you go to Indonesia, Tom and myself have been working in Indonesia for a while, and this is Merapi volcano, and the area around the volcano is extremely fertile, and the good thing in Indonesia, it's very wet, it's tropical, so we have loads of water. And to bring these two components together, water and volcanic soil, makes for a really fertile environment. Here is a Merapi volcano, and high up on the slopes, of course, there's little vegetation, but in the lower parts, there's loads of vegetation. And uh, here is a pyroclastic deposit that's quarried, and partly they're quarrying this in order to produce building supplements. They put this in the concrete. Partly they quarry it in order to create more sediment traps for new pyroclastic flows, and partly it's spread out on the fields in order to increase fertility of the soil. And here's just a few more impressions to give you a scale of the operation. It's quite an economic factor in the region there. And uh, the things grown there, they go from vegetables like chilies to chocolate beans, and you can buy them locally, but they're also exported. And uh, another plant, another cash crop that's very popular in the area is this one. Anyone any idea what that might be? No silence in the room. This is tobacco. So tobacco is really popular there, and also uh, here, of course, I mean, um, a lot of the rolling tobacco you get uh, from Dutch companies comes from Indonesia, and this is a flowering tobacco plant. And uh, here is uh, um, a more mature tobacco plant, and you see the leaves are going brown, this is what will be harvested eventually, and uh, this is what you can buy in shops. And here, uh, I bought this recently, this is cigars, and uh, they come from Sumatra, and uh, I think, uh, well, smoking is probably a bad thing in terms of your health, but uh, for celebration I still like cigars. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's our garden party with my master students. So we were smoking the Sumatran cigars just recently. And I guess on occasion it's okay. But tobacco is, only useful, is also useful for medical purposes and for fertilizers. So this is something where I think uh, the future of tobacco farming will go that uh, hopefully people will stop smoking so much and uh, tobacco will, however, still be a product that will be widely grown for these reasons. So I stopped smoking a few years ago and uh, I fell into the habit 
of, uh, well, another addiction, if you will. Now, I, it's coffee that I really enjoy. So I brought my coffee here as well. And I should point out that over 70% of coffee is grown on volcanic soil. There's a link between coffee and volcanoes. And uh, this is a cup of coffee I was served in Ijen, which is a volcanic caldera in Indonesia. And uh, it came with some coffee beans here, just to show. So I'll give you a few impressions of this as well. This is a coffee plantation in Indonesia, and the caldera wall is just here and in the rear there. And uh, it looks a little wild and messy, but uh, you have a lot of these coffee plants there. And they have some taller trees in order to provide shadow for the coffee plants. So here you go, it's quite large areas and uh, a lot of coffee is produced in Java. Here's some coffee beans, the red ones are the ripe ones. And this is how they look. And eventually they are harvested and uh, the beans itself are very moist, so they need to be dried. And I took this photo in the uh, coffee plantation, it was on the wall because it wasn't harvesting season when I was there. But this is how it's spread out and how the coffee beans are dried. And eventually, once they're dried, uh, this is the dried ones, then they will be roasted. And that looks like that, of course. And eventually, we make coffee from it. And as you probably find in various shops and supermarkets, there is, in this case, hot lava java coffee and things like that. So there is a clear link between volcanoes and coffee. You need high altitude, you need water, and uh, you need volcanic soil. So, but this is where the issue starts, the real core of my talk. I've just taken you to Indonesia, and this is a tropical area, and there's loads of volcanic ash, and uh, uh, therefore also volcanic soil. But if we go to other parts of the world, water may be an issue. And I did my PhD in the Canary Islands, which is about here, and as you see, this is very dry. So, there we have volcanic soil, we have variable altitude, but we don't have a lot of water. And that's where it gets interesting, at least for this presentation. So, the uh, <clears throat> issue is that how can we use these volcanic particles in order to help the situation there? And uh, in the Canaries, these small lapilli stones are called picon, that's a local term. And they're widely used, not only as building supplement, but also as supplement for the soils. And this goes back to the 18th century. In fact, this goes back to Lanzarote, and uh, some of you may have been to Lanzarote on holiday or for work, I don't know, but um, my first contact with Lanzarote was when I was a little boy, watching, for the older ones here, watching the TV production Tintala. And uh, I got a picture from the internet here. This was largely filmed on Lanzarote and had these volcanic landscapes that were really fascinating. And, um, well, as you, if you watch Timtala, as you might remember, it's a very barren island. There's a lot of lava and pecan, but there isn't a lot of vegetation in many parts. And it stems back to this eruption, the 1730 to 36 eruption. What happened there is that there was intense earthquakes. The eruption commenced in mid 1730, and um, it started, uh, sorry, um, the eruption uh, started really in early, um, uh, 1731, and by that point, um, the government, the king in Madrid, got very worried, and he sent a bishop to observe what was going on, and this person, Davia de Cardenas, was sent to observe what was going on. He arrived on the island in uh, the middle of 1731, and uh, he recommended that the area needs to be largely evacuated and by end of that year most of the villagers and most of the people of the island had been evacuated to some of the other islands. So he stayed a little longer and he made some observations. And he made one fundamental observation. He realized where there is loads of lapilli and ash covering fields, the vegetation dies. However, if there was a thin cover of lapilli, just a few centimeters, the fields were blooming and he realized this is really useful beyond the actual problem of the eruption there. And uh, in his recommendations after the eruption, he really encouraged the villagers when they returned to use this uh, discovery or this observation 
in order to really use this for agriculture. So, large areas of the island were devastated by the eruption. Here's lava flows of the various pulses. The eruption took six years before it ended, and it uh, destroyed some 20 to 25 percent of the surface of the island. But when the villagers returned, they were instructed to use this idea, and they used it widely. The result was that new crops were suddenly um, uh, produced, and uh, they produced cereals, potatoes, fruit, and also wine for the first time in the Canary Islands. And the population doubled in the decades after that because of that. So a larger amount of people could be sustained because of this simple observation of the thickness of lapilli on the fields. And it's still used today. Here we have these rather typical areas on Lanzarote for wine growth. And they have little windshields here, and they dig little holes into the lapilli. And uh, the roots are in the soil, but the lapilli are surrounding. And uh, this has been rather famous for wine production. And uh, here we see, to today, many of the valleys on Lanzarote are filled with lapilli, artificially filled with lapilli, and they use this technique in order to grow the wine. The holes are dug in order to protect the plants from the wind, because the wind can be very strong, and uh, the lapilli provide not only nutrients, but also moisture. This was so successful that uh, certain grapes were grown, like the famous Manvaiza wine, and it was even drank at the Vienna Congress in 1814. It's on the menu there. So, um, if you go to Vienna to EGU, you may have a think about this. So, here is some impressions. This is one of these holes stuck. Here's one of these protective walls. And the plant, the wine, is actually in there. And uh, it grows to about this height. And usually it doesn't grow beyond there because the wind is too strong. And if you go to Lanzarote, I mean, uh, well, there's different opinions about canary wine. But I do enjoy it at times. Um, let's hop to the next island, Gran Canaria. It's the larger island and uh, the population density is a little higher. And uh, here many parts of the island are dry as well, but other parts are very lush and green. And here's some impressions. Usually in the valley bottoms, that's where we have a lot of vegetation and that is where a lot of volcanic detritus accumulates. And of course this is artificially increased. Here's the valley of La Aldea, and uh, this is um, the city of San Nicolas, and it's the tomato capital of the island. So here they're using greenhouses in order to protect the plants from the wind, and uh, the soil is supplemented with these volcanic particles, and many of the tomatoes you buy in the supermarkets here come from these greenhouses, in fact. So, um, it's also used as a building uh, supplement, so many of these houses here will have volcanic particles in their uh, concrete structure, and uh, this is one of the scenic suburbs of uh, La Palma, and uh, Las Palmas, sorry. And uh, here is some of the quarries. I went through the trouble of going to some of the quarries where this is uh, actually harvested. And uh, here's various examples. And they're actually separating the volcanic particles already in the quarry into Picon Hydrofonico, into Picon Normal, and Arena. And uh, one is used for gardening, the other for agriculture, and the next one is a building supplement. So they assess the quality of this already in the production stage and they deliver that to the various uh, interest groups that use these things. So here is a few more examples and uh, there's some positive things as I point out about these particles but there's also some negative things and that is uh, well many of these cinder cones here they're not pristine anymore. So the quarrying is quite intense in places and uh, it leaves some scars in the landscape. This is an active quarry, it's pretty much out of sight, so nobody takes offense, but uh, these places here are quite visible, and they're not very attractive to look at. So here's an example. This is um, <clears throat> one of the little cintercones in the north of the island. Here's an image I found from 1906, where the flank here was still intact, and this is the flank today. Now they stopped quarrying that. Here's a picture with uh, some of my students 
on this side here. And this is an open scar now, and it's not stable, it's not protected, so it's going to erode further, unfortunately. And this is a downside of the quarrying and the use of these particles. I'd like to take you to Tenerife as well. And uh, Tenerife has loads of these pecan layers and uh, lapilli deposits and also pumices here. The light colored layer is a pumice. This is more of the scoria type lapilli deposits. And it's also widely quarried on the island there. And uh, some of the recent eruptions have produced a lot of these lapilli. You need strombolian type eruptions here. On Tenerife, we have this triple arm drift zone and we have vents clustering along them and many of the eruptions there are strombolian about 80 percent of the historical eruptions were of this type and they are quarried for the use of um, uh, in agriculture here's the orotava valley which was a major agricultural area already since the early spanish colonization and uh, this is also where the botanical gardens are in tenerife and uh, yes a lot of Quarrying is still active also in Tenerife and it leads to a lot of banana production, tomato production, pineapples and all that kind of thing. So here is an impression of the Orotava Valley with Taylor Volcano in the far distance. And this is the botanical garden in the city of La Orotava. So the southern part of the island is very dry and here we have some cinticones as well. This is effectively lapilli deposits. And um, the northern part of the island is more moist, and there we have a lot more agriculture, but there is increasing attempts to make the dry parts fertile as well, and they're really supplementing the soil wherever it's useful. And uh, this is the area around the airport, and there is plans to actually create artificial agricultural land, and also human use land in the sense of golf courses and things like that. So the local people, the Guanches, they were avoiding these areas because it was too dry, but we have the opportunity now to make them useful for our purpose. So here's some quarries on Tenerife, and uh, some of them look quite ugly, this one in particular. So here we have the Sintercone, and there's several large crevasses, actually little quarries, and I checked out what the story is, and it turns out that the different slices of the Sintercon were owned by different people. And each of them made their own quarry. And that's why it looks so, well, not so pretty at least. And um, there's some other kind of rather not so cool stories. There is the three Sintercons that Humboldt described in the Orotava Valley. And if you go there today, there's only two. One has been completely quarried away. It's described, I don't know whether it's true, but it's described that Humboldt was crying when he saw the Orotava Valley because he said it was so pretty. And nowadays, well, we are missing one and a half Sintercons. This one is partly quarried as well. So the area has changed because of human interaction. I'd like to bring you to La Palma now, which is the youngest of the islands, or one of the youngest of the islands. There's a lot of historical eruptions. There is the 1646, 1712, 1949. The youngest eruption there is the 1971 eruption. Most of them had strombolian activity besides lava flows. And uh, here's the Cumbre Vieja. You see the vents here and a lot of lapilli material. And that's also mined and quarried in many places to supplement the island's agriculture. So here is um, some images. This is the 1949 eruption. This is a photo. This is one of the vents of the 1949 eruption. And the lavas reached all the way to the coast in this area and they made a lava platform. And uh, several of the older eruptions made similar lava platforms. And the lava platforms are really, really attractive for agriculture. So here's some impressions. This is the 1949 lava platform. And as you see, it's completely green. Well, with the exception of some greenhouses. And uh, virtually all of it has been now uh, supplemented with topsoil and lapilli, and it's used for pineapple, tomato, banana growth. And uh, this is not just the case for the 1949 platform, it's also the case for the older platforms. So here we have the 1712 platform, the 1585, and there's a few more this way, and it's completely covered with fields 
and greenhouses. So they can really sustain the island with uh, uh, agricultural produce and beyond, they export a lot of it. And this is a not ideal starting situation. Here's a picture of how the lava platform formed, but because of the supplementing of the soil with lapilli, they managed to really make this um, an agricultural El Dorado. So here the 1971 eruption and here we have some pictures taken of some of these Trombolian eruption showing how lapilli are made and here we have fragmentation of the lava into small fragments and this is intriguing because the fragments have a lot of vesicles and I think this is part of the secret of Picot. So here's an aerial picture of all the lava flows, uh, sorry, all the lava platforms from the historical eruptions here on the western side of the island. You see how green it is. And this is the 1971 vents. And they came down here. They made a little lava platform as well. And part of it is already fields by now. So what is the secret behind Picon? What's it doing? Why is it so effective? Well, first of all, we have to think about the water in the Canary Islands. There isn't a lot of water itself, there isn't high rainfall, but there is a lot of moist air that's brought with the trade winds. So we have a lot of clouds. Humboldt described it as the sea of clouds that happens almost daily in the Canary Islands. And uh, what the pecan, the lapilli, really does, it captures the moisture in its vesicles. So the moisture is trapped in the vesicles and it will not necessarily be released during hot parts of the day because it might form steam, but it will be trapped in many of these little vesicles and bubbles. And that's why it stays longer near the soil or even in the soil. And this allows plants to profit from that. So here's some impressions of uh, the sea of clouds. And you probably know there's a lot of beetles, for example, in the Sahara that live off dew. And that's the same concept here. So we don't need rainfall, we just need wet air in order to sustain this concept with pecan. Here is a view from Tate Volcano looking towards the northeast and uh, this is the Sea of Clouds. And there is a whole ring of forest, the Corona Forestal, around the island and it's all really supplied by these clouds. It's not rainfall that brings the water here. And uh, here is just a Google Earth image and uh, see this green band here, that's the Corona Forestal. This is the level at which the clouds come in. And you have less vegetation above and less below. You may have heard or not uh, about the holy tree on the island of El Hierro. Um, I was very intrigued when I heard about this. This is an old um, drawing from the 16th century. And the story goes that when the Spaniards arrived, the locals escaped into the mountains. The Spaniards thought that, oh well, they will die up there because there's no water. But indeed, they survived and they lived there for many years and the Spaniards couldn't get them. And they had a little secret and this was the holy tree, the Garahoy. And uh, the tree is located, it's still there today, uh, is located in this cloud zone. And it collects water from, um, from the dew but it was underlain by an impermeable horizon, so it started to dribble. It's basically water falling down from dew, from the tree, and you can collect it in little pools. And this was the water supply of the Guanches, the Aboriginal people, and uh, they were able to escape the Spaniard invasion for at least some time with this little trip. So, um, here's uh, a little impression from uh, the apartment I was living in a few years ago during field work and as it just happened there was a delivery of gardening pecan and of course they quarried this in a dry state but leaving it overnight I noted that there's a lot of moisture in there it's in the vesicles and of course it then um, comes out as little moisture films on the side of these bags and this gives you a feeling for how much moisture is stored in these particles, even though they are put in the bags in a dry state. 
So, this is a little trick, effectively, that you get uh, taught in survival skills. You can use this even in dry areas. And uh, this is effectively what's going on. So, this is part of the secret of Picard. But it's not everything. I couldn't resist and I took some of these particles and I put them under the scanning electron microscope and uh, it turned out that it's not just moisture that's trapped. The real secret is actually microorganisms. And here's a bubble, here's a vesicle in some of these, in, in one of these samples. And look, it's full of little microorganisms. And here's a better picture of one of them. For most parts they are diatoms, but some others as well. I'm not a zoologist, I don't know all these creatures, but I checked with our paleontologists and they helped me to identify some of them. Many of them are freshwater diatoms and they live in these vesicles. And they help to break down the particle. By doing that, they release nutrients into the soil and this is what the plants actually take in. So here's loads of these microorganisms and I give some names down here, I personally can't pronounce them, but um, um, this is the identification by my paleontology colleagues and uh, there is all types of things. Some of these have previously been described from crater lakes in the Eiffel, for example, and uh, I suspect they might like alkaline volcanic rocks and they help breaking them down. So <clears throat> there's a whole life in there and if you have artificial or real volcanic particles in your flower pot in your office, there is microorganisms living in there and they help to make the plants uh, be well supplied with these nutrients. So a variety of microorganisms live in these rocks and they help to produce gradual supply of phosphorus, nitrogen and potassium. This is a real advantage as opposed to artificial fertilizers. If you put them on the field, and it rains, you run it off very quickly. These particles, they allow, with the help of microorganisms, to produce a steady supply of these nutrients, and that helps the plants. Also, and this is really important now, this is the not so fun aspect, and that is microorganisms lock CO2. And just yesterday I learned that the Irish government is thinking now to put volcanic ash into agricultural soil in order to lock CO2 because their CO2 budget is not very good and uh, they want to reduce CO2 emissions and therefore they are thinking about processes like this or using volcanic particles in this kind of concept. So if you have living soil, meaning rich in microorganisms, then you can sequester a lot of CO2 into the soil and uh, it might help us with our climate goals in the future. So, with time, living soil will progressively lock more and more CO2 in the organisms, but also in the plants that take it up. And if you bring more organisms in, you will sequester more CO2. So, carbon dioxide released from the roots of the plants is actually done in order to attract microorganisms, and this seems to work well. So, this is part of the secret of Picon. And uh, here there is of course now possible thoughts to use this in a much wider scale and to help our CO2 issues with future climate emissions. So the outlook here is that, well, thinking back to Mr. Davia, the bishop, he started effectively an agricultural revolution on the islands. Many more people have been fed because of this. And uh, his foresight has really made a difference in the Canaries and elsewhere. So Picon delivers a magical ingredient to engineer soil quality because it traps water and it allows a lot of microorganisms to flourish. And that can be used to create fertile soil in what is otherwise considered bad lands. Now, because of this, um, there is now suddenly the possibilities to create areas with high fertility in what is nowadays bone dry and as you might remember the Canaries are in the same climate zone as the Sahara and the Sahara is a huge, a vast area that is currently unused. So here is a little climate prediction for how things might change over the next few years and this is where the Canary Islands are. The other examples down here he uh, brought forward earlier this is uh, Indonesia, and it's going to stay wet in Indonesia. That's not the concern, but looking at this area here, this huge dry belt here, this is something that we have no real use for at the moment. 
I mean, there's some oil here, of course, and we're getting this out, but in terms of feeding a growing population, this is a wasteland. And with the right mix of irrigation and potentially supplementing the soil, there is the potential over the next 50, 100, 200 years to create some large crop farms in that area, I believe, and make fertile land out of wastelands of this type. So, if you're interested and want to read more, here's some advertisement for my book. So, uh, The Geology of the Canary Islands, where we talk a little bit about building stones and agriculture as well. And, uh, well, we published this as well in a little article, um, and I have some reprints here for those of you who are interested. Thank you for your attention, and should there be questions, go ahead. Thank <laughs> you.